All right, uh, there are a couple of things. Um, first is, if, did you miss this quiz last week? If you missed this quiz, you can still have a chance to turn it in. It's going to be number 87. All right, the second announcement is that uh, tomorrow I have experiment 10 scheduled. But I have to leave early tomorrow um, for an appointment out of town. So I'm going to switch the dates on these. So I'm going to move experiment eight to um, tomorrow. Experiment eight is dry lab. I'm just going to be drawing the structures. And then experiment 10 will um, push to November 8th. So just swap these two labs. Okay, any questions? All right, if no questions, then we're just going to continue. Um, with quantum. So what do we have so far in quantum? Did the shell, the orbital. Did we do the orbital? Um, yes. Yeah. Like L and M. Are, are okay. Yeah. So we did the shells and orbitals and the orbitals. And we drew a diagram. Did we draw a diagram? Uh, like a diagram? Let's see if I can find it. We need to know that uh, this is called the energy level diagram or the orbital energy level diagram. <laughs> the uh, lowest energy orbital, an orbital is the allowed state for the electron, so the lowest energy orbital is the Yeah, one s. Um, but there's another way of uh, noting the one s. What's the other way of? Like one zero zero. One zero zero. And um, what do each of these represent? The one is representing what? Um. Energy? energy or N, energy level, as you want to call it. The zero, the first zero represents the shape or L. And the second zero represents M, 
the number and orientation. Yeah, the magnetic quantum number, N, L, and M. So the lowest energy orbital is 1, 0, 0. So when N equals 1, then um, what are the possible L values? The possible L values are all L values up to a max of N minus 1. Well, 1 minus 1 is 0, so L can only be equal to 0. An L equals 0 we call S. It's the S orbital here. So this would be the lowest energy orbital. In quantum mechanics, what we want to do is we want to pinpoint the energy. So energy level diagram like this is very important because here we pinpointed the energy. But Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that if you pinpoint one, the other one will be uncertain. So if we pinpoint the energy, do you know what's going to be uncertain? Well, we want to know two things. We want to know the energy of the electron, and we also want to know its position where that electron is. So if we pinpoint the energy like this, what can we say about the position? Well, the position is going to be uncertain, but it's not a total mystery. We know within like 95% probability or 95% confidence where the electron is. And where was the electron for the 1s orbital? Does it look like? It looks like this. You'll have the proton here, and then we have a bunch of dots. You know what these dots represent? The dots represent the probability of finding the electron. And so the greater the density of dots, the greater the probability of finding the electron, and the lower the density of dots, the lower the probability of finding the electron is. And so what we do is we, we come up with what's called a 95% probability boundary. It represents something like this. So there's a 95% chance of finding the electron in here and a 5% chance of finding it outside. And so it doesn't go. It's not, you know, there's going to be a finite limit to, to that. And so we call this the orbital. The orbital is we want to know the energy and where the electron is, the position. So this is the 1s orbital. Okay, what's the next orbital? The next orbital is the 2s orbital, so there's going to be a big jump up to the 2s. The 2s orbital has an n of 2, an l of 0, and an m of 0. m values from, m values uh, vary from uh, plus l and minus l, so we'll go from plus 0 to minus 0, so there's only one value. What can we say about the orbital? One thing we can say about the orbital is it's going to be more energetic. So the electron is going to have a higher chance of being found further out in the nuclear. And so the density distribution is going to be something like this, but it's going to have a, a greater chance of being found further from the nucleus. So when we look at the 95% boundary for this, it's about four times bigger in terms of radius. So that would be the 2s orbital. Okay. But we can also have, well, if, if L is equal to 2, or actually L can't equal to, if L is equal to 0, we have one more L value that's, that's possible. And the other L value that's possible is L equals 1. Okay, so if N is equal to 2, we can have L equal 1, so we'll get 2, 1. And then if L is equal to 1, then the possible M values will range from minus 1, that is minus L, to plus L. So we'll have 2, 1, minus 1, 2, 1, 0, and 2, 1, plus 1. And so that gives us a total of three orbitals like this. These orbitals we call, um, not the S, but we call these what? Uh, P? P. These are the P orbitals here. And we have three 2P orbitals. Why? Because M is going to tell us. We have three values for M. This is N, L, M. M goes from minus L, which is minus 1, 
to plus L, which is plus one, and goes through zero. So that's how we know. Now, is L equals two possible here? In this case, L equals two would be forbidden. The reason why L equals two is forbidden is because the maximum L value we can have is n minus one. n is two, minus one is one. And so the maximum L value we can have is one. And so this would exceed the max. If we exceed the max, that's a mathematical violation of what equation? It's, you know what equation? Where all this comes from? Mm -hmm. The Schrodinger equation. So if we try to plug in an L equals 2 when an N equals 2, then what it gives us is it gives us a forbidden energy. That is, it's not a solution or an answer to the Schrodinger equation. And so what we have to do is we have to move up now to our next N value. Our next N value will be higher in energy, and that's going to be N equals 3. If N equals 3, then what are my choices for L? Well, if n equals 3, then I can have l equals 0. So I have 3, 0. If n equals 3, I can have a 3, 1. If n equals 3, then I can have a 3, 2. I'm going to write the 3, 2 up a little high, like this. And so these are my possible l values. If I have n equals 3, then I can have l equals 0. Here. I could have L equals 1 here, and I could have L equals 2, which is here. But could I have L equals 3? If N equals 3, L cannot be equal to 3 because that would exceed the max L value and it would, uh, wouldn't solve the Schrodinger equation. And so we go back over here. Now, if N equals 3 and L equals 0, what are my M values? The M values are going to range from plus zero to minus zero. Well, plus zero to minus zero, there's only one value, and that's zero. And so this is the three zero zero orbital, or known as the three s orbital. If, if n equals three and l equals one, then what are my possible m values? My possible m values would be Minus L to plus L. Minus L is minus 1 through 0 through plus L. And so I'm going to have three orbitals with three different orientations. I'm going to have the 3, 1, negative 1, 3, 1, 0, and 3, 1, 1. Okay. Now the P orbitals are going to be dumbbell shaped like this. So this would be the 2P. And then a different orientation here, this would be, let's say, the negative 1 orientation. The 0 orientation would be perpendicular to that. And the 1 orientation would be perpendicular to both of them. Something like that. And so you have the dumbbell. Um, typically we say on the x, the y, and the z axis. Now, an n equals 3 is going to be a bigger orbital. It's higher energy, and so it's going to be a lot bigger. So let's say if the n equals 2 is 4 times bigger, the n equals 3 is actually going to be about 9 times bigger than an n equals 1. So this is going to be quite a bit bigger here. But we're allowed one more L value. We're allowed L equals 2. And so L equals 0 is S, L equals 1 is P, L equals 2, you know what we call this? D. So some people remember F. S is a spherical shape, or a circle, like that. P is a dumbbell shape. And so F, they think spherical. P, why is that dumbbell? And D, what is a D shape? Well, the S and the P have a meaning, and the D have a meaning. The S comes from spectroscopy, and that, there's a sharp line in the spectrum of this which um, is attributed to these electrons. P is the principal, there's a big principal band associated with that. D is diffuse. 
And so the origins come from spectroscopy. F is the next one. F, um, there's no relationship. It just goes alphabetical after that. And so here, if we're at 3, 2, this is N, L, what are my possible M values? So I go 3, 2, what? 3, 2, M values range from what to what? Minus the minus L to plus L. So minus L would be minus two. Then what would the next one be? Three, two, minus one, three, two, zero, three, two, one, three, two, two. So do you see how M tells us the number of orbitals? How many orbitals? Well, each one is going to be one orbital. And so that gives me a total of five values for M. Minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. So they're going to be five orbitals. And uh, we call these the 3D orbitals here. There are three D orbitals. So 3D orbitals. Okay. They're going to be higher in energy. So when we go 2s to 2p, 2p is higher in energy, slightly. We go 3s to 3p, 3p is higher in energy, and then 3p to 3d, 3d is higher in energy. Okay. But the energies are kind of kind of get mixed up. Because this is what we expect. We, we expect to go from 3s to 3p to 3d, but that's not what's observed. What's observed is this. We go from 3s to 3p, and then we go over here to 4s, which is 400. This is 4s. And then we go to 3d, and then we go to 4p. So I need a little bit more space there. So we go 4s to 3d to 4p. Now, how do you remember that? So we can see that here. We go 4s to 3d to 4p. Well, where's 4d? 4d is way up here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide this into shells. So the first shell is here, and then the second shell is going to consist of the 2s and the 2p, this would be the second shell. And then the third shell is here, and then the 4s, 3d, 4p, this is going to be the fourth shell. Uh, so you need to know the orbital energy level diagram through the fourth shell. Can you draw it? Through the fourth shell? Yeah. Like we did here. And then it just keeps going. Okay, there are different ways to remember this here. Um, one way of remembering this ordering, because it did get mixed up, we didn't go from 3p to 3d, we went from 3p to 4s to 3d to 4p. And so the easy way of remembering that is this pyramid. 
pair. Here's L equals zero. Here, I mean, L equals zero. Here's L equals one. We have L equals two. So when n is equal to one, L is equal to zero, we can't have L equal one, that would violate. When n is equal to two, then we can have L equals zero, L equals one, but we can't have L equals two. When n equals three, then we can have L equals zero, L equals one, and L equals two. When n equals four, we can have L equals zero, L equals one, L equals 2 and L equals 3. When L equals 3, do you know what letter we use for that? It's not D, it's going to be, it's not E, it's going to be F. E got skipped. So we'll have 4 out. When n equals 5, we can have L equals 0, we could have L equals 1, we could have L equals 2, we can have L equals 3, and we could have L equals 4. So L equals 3 is called F. What do you think L equals 4 is called? A, B, C, D. Yeah, it goes alphabetical after that, so it's going to be G. But can we have L equals 5? We could, but could we have it when N equals 5? So in other words, L equals 5, this is going to be G, this is going to be H. Can we have a 5H orbital? Does that exist? No, a 5H orbital would violate the Schrodinger equation, and uh, it does not exist. It would be forbidden. When um, n equals 6, we can have l equals 0, which would be the S. We can have l equals 1, which would be the P. We can have l equals 2, which would be the D. We can have l equals 3, which would be the F. We could have L equals 4, which would be the G, and we could have L equals 5, which would be the H. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, build up the shells. The shells always start with an S. So the first shell starts with an S, second starts with an S. All the shells start with an S. The shells are a group of closely spaced orbitals. And so we can figure out the shells here. The first shell is going to consist of one S. Because the next shell would consist of two S to two P. So this would be the first shell. This would be the second shell. The third shell would start with three S and then go to three P, but would stop here at four S. This would be the third shell. The fourth shell starts with 4s and then goes to 4p, I mean 3d, sorry, 3d to 4p and stops here. This would be the fourth shell. The fifth shell starts with the s and then goes to 4d, 5p, and then stops there. The sixth shell would go from 6s to 4F to 5D to 6P, and then we'd start the next shell at 7. You see how that works? So we can figure out all the orbitals in the particular shell. These are called sub-shells, and then we have the full shell. Here. There are other mathematical patterns, um, which we'll just briefly mention, but you aren't responsible for the... Do you know how many subshells? Do you see a pattern here? How many subshells do we have in the first shell? Just one. How many subshells do we have in the second shell? 
two, and the third, sh the third shell, we only have two subshells. Do you see that? But how many subshells have an n equals three that is in what we call the third energy level, or n equals three? N equals three will have three subshells, actually. And n equals four is going to have how many subshells? Four. N equals five has five subshells. And so um, we can figure out the number of subshells base. Like n equals 10, how many subshells are going to be in n equals 10? 10 subshells. n equals 100, how many subshells? 100. What are they? Well, they're going to be the 100s. That's one subshell. 100p, two subshells. 100d, 100f, 100g, h, i, j, k, l, m, l, p, etc. And so we can get them all. <clears throat> all right. So there are n subshells for every n. What are some other patterns? How many orbitals are there in a subshell? Do you see a mathematical pattern for that? How many orbitals in a subshell? So for example, the S orbital only has one orbital. The P subshell has three orbitals. The D subshell has five orbitals. Do you know how many orbitals will be in the F subshell? So the D orbitals have five, I mean, the D subshell has five orbitals. What are they? Okay, this is going to be 4, 2, negative 2, 4, 2, negative 1, 4, 2, 0, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 2. It's five. The F, how many subshells? I mean, the F subshell has how many orbitals? So F is L is equal to 3. So we're going to go from 4, 3, Minus 3, 4, 3, minus 2, 4, 3, minus 1, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 3. So how many is that? That's 7. 7 orbitals here. What are they? The, the, the minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. That's what they are. When L is equal to 3. Um, when L is equal to 4, how many orbitals are there? How many orbitals are there in the G subshell? So if I'm looking at the 5G, how many orbitals are there? No. Nine. Yeah. So do you see a pattern to it? There is a pattern to it. Different ways you could describe the pattern. Um, one way we could describe the pattern is this. It's going to be um, 2L plus 1. So, for example, if I'm looking at 2, I got two values on this side of 0, minus 1, minus 2. Two values on this side of 0, 1 and 2. So, it's going to be 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 is 0. So, it's 2L plus 1. It gives us 5. 2L plus 1. So, L is 1, 2 times that. Is 2 plus 1 is 3. 2L plus 1 here. So if L is equal to 100, how many orbitals are there? <coughs> 201. If L is equal to a million, how many orbitals are there? 2 million and 1. You have a million from negative to 0, and a million from plus 1 to a million, and then the 0. So 2 million and 1. Can we have an L equals a million? Well, actually, yeah, because how many orbitals are there? Yeah, n is going to go all the way to infinity. Now, infinity isn't infinitely far away in terms of energy. In terms of distance, it'd be infinitely far away. 
But in terms of energy, it's up here. And so they didn't write n equals infinity, but n equals infinity would be somewhere up here. In terms of size, it'd be huge. You know, in terms of size, you know, an n equals two is about four times bigger. And n equals three is about nine times bigger. And n equals four is about how many times bigger? So n equals two is about four times bigger. N equals three is about nine times bigger. N equals four is going to be about how many times bigger? Close. Not 12. 16. 16 times bigger. It goes by the square. So anyway, there are other patterns in here. We're not going to get into the other patterns. What you need to know is you need to, to be able to draw this. Can you draw this to the fourth shell? Up here. If you can draw this to the fourth shell, that's what you need to be able to do. This first part here. Okay, then what we need to do is we need to be able to label. Can you label these orbitals to the fourth shell? No. There are two conventions for labeling it. One is the NLM, the other is just like the 2P, 3P, etc. And then the next thing you need to do is you need to be able to fill these orbitals with electrons. So uh, there you need to be aware of the off-bow principle. What did the off-bow principle say? Full the lowest energy first. So for hydrogen, hydrogen has one electron. Where am I going to put the one electron? I'm going to find the lowest energy orbital and put it there. And I'm going to represent it with an arrow to be the spin up or spin down. That's hydrogen. And then what comes after hydrogen? Helium. Helium has two electrons. And uh, these have to be opposing spin. Otherwise, if I put them the same spin, it would violate what principle? What exclusion principle? The Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli exclusion principle says what? That no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So this has to be different. So this is going to be plus one half, that's going to be minus one half. One zero zero plus one half, one zero zero minus one half. Once, we, um, once we're at helium, the first shell is filled. So the first shell is often called helium. You know, once we fill that, that's called the helium shell or the helium core. And then we go to lithium. Lithium has three electrons. We'll throw that in the 2s. And then beryllium has four electrons. We can't put another electron in there because um, of the Pauli exclusion principle. Another electron would have to be either plus one half or minus one half, which means they would violate. And so um, the fifth electron's got to go here. This would be boron. And then uh, the sixth electron goes where? Should I pair it up here or should I put it in one of these other ones? Do I pair it or fill these singly? Singly. And should I oppose the spin or match the spin? In other words, should I have parallel or anti-parallel spin? Parallel spin. So filling these singly with parallel spin is what rule? Hun's rule. And so Hun's rule says we're going to fill these singly with parallel spin until we can't. And so this will be nitrogen. And then oxygen would add another electron. Here we have to pair that. It'll be oxygen. The reason we don't want to pair is because they want more space. You know, both electrons are negatively charged. So we get what's called electron electron repulsion here. Okay. And so we'll try to postpone pairing up until we have to. So. 
probably oxygen, fluorine, and then finally neon. You like that? Neon would fill the the second shell and the first shell. And you know. After neon, um, we're going to go to uh, sodium. So sodium would be here, 3s as a micron. This would be 300 plus one half. Then um, magnesium and aluminum and silicon. And then phosphorus, just like that. Sulfur, chlorine, argon. And so once we fill the third shell, this would be argon. Etc. Um, we're going to spend some time looking at the fourth shell here. Um, but before I do that, let's talk about some ways of doing writing this. The energy level diagram like this is going to be the most descriptive because we see the relative energies here. Um, in an energy level diagram, we don't draw the shapes. But typically, you know what the shapes are. This is going to be dumbbell shape. Um, so the three key will look like the two key, except the three key are going to be a lot bigger. There's actually there's some more complex features about this, which we're not going to talk about. So the 3s, 3p, you know what the d orbitals look like? The d orbitals are like clover sheet, clover, um, four leaf clover shape. So this would be a d orbital. Although the size should be quite a bit bigger you know, because it's three compared to the two. So it should be about, these are about four times bigger than the one. These will be about nine times bigger than the one. But spatially, it should be a lot bigger. So this is shrunk down a little bit. All right, so if we look at argon, there are different ways of representing it. The most descriptive is the energy level diagram, but it takes up too much space. And so what are some alternatives? Alternatives would be an orbital box diagram. The advantage of an orbital box diagram is you can fit it onto one line. So, for example, for argon, we'd have 1s followed by the 2s followed by the 2p. The 2p would draw three boxes, each orbital, followed by the 3s followed by the 3p. Now, the 3d are in the next shell. So, I'm not going to write them here. In fact, the 4s comes before the 3p. Okay, now we fill these with electrons. And so in the orbital box diagram, I use arrows. Like this to put the electrons in here. We have something called the electron configuration. Um, the disadvantage of the orbital box is we don't see the relative energies. So it shows the spacing as being even, you know, between 1s, 2s, and 2s and 2p. There's a gap there. But there's a big jump in going in energy from 1s to 2s, and a small jump in energy going from 2s to 2p. But that's not reflected in an orbital box diagram. In an orbital box diagram, everything's evenly spaced. So you, you lose the information about relative energy. There's another way of writing this in a more compact form, and that's called the electron configuration. We have a num number of variations for electron configuration. 
So for the electron configuration, we say that there's a 1s orbital, and we have this little squared here. That squared is not squared. It's not 1s squared. We say 1s2. The 2 means there are two electrons in the 1s orbital. And the next orbital would be a 2s, and there are two electrons here. And then we have three 2p orbitals. And the letter de designation varies. Like, one of these is going to have the negative 1 orientation. So sometimes we'll just call the negative. Let's say we're going to define the negative 1 orientation as the one that lies on the x-axis. So this would be the 2, 1, negative 1. There are two electrons in there. Let's say the 0 orientation here lies on the y-axis. So this will be 2, p, y. And let's say the... Um, one configuration here lies on the z-axis, so this will be 2pz2. And so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2px2, which is this orbital here, 2py2, this orbital, and 2pz2, which would be that orbital. And so this would be the x, the y, and the z, which is in straight out. Then we'll go to 3s2, and then the same thing for the P's 3px2, 3py2, and 3pz2. And then we're done. Um, what do we lose? Uh, we lose a little bit of information about the spin, you know, the pairing. We'll lose a lot more information about the spin if we write this in even more compact form. And so the more compact form is just combine all the two p orbitals. And so what we'll do is we'll call 1s2, that's fine, 2s2. But the 2p, we combine them all and call it 2p6. That is, if I look at all of the 2p orbitals combined, they can hold a max of six electrons, which they are in this case. 3s2, 3p6. Here. And so this is the condensed electron configuration. And lastly, what we could do is we could use a noble gas abbreviation. So, for example, I could, instead of calling this 1s2, I could just call it helium. You know, helium has a first shell and fill. And so this would be helium, and then 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Well, we typically don't do that, um, because we want to abbreviate as much as possible. So we could fill the first and the second shell. If we fill it with the first and second shell, then it's called neon. So this would be neon 3s2, 3p6. But when we look at 3s2, 3p6, that's filling the third shell. The third shell is completely filled, and so that would be equal to argon. And so these are abbreviations we could use. We could use the helium abbreviation for 1s2, the neon abbreviation for 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and the argon abbreviation for 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And so these are all examples of electron configurations here. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the fourth shell. Filling the fourth shell. Next. So I'm going to erase the first, second, and third shell. And uh, I'm going to call it the first, second, and third shell. I'm just going to say it's argon up to here. So we fill the first, second, and third shell, we're up to argon, and then we're going to fill the 4s. The 4s fills first before the 3d. Turns out, oddly enough, the 4s are lower in energy than the 3d. So let's go to the, um, the fourth shell. After we go from argon, what's the next element? Next element will be potassium. Uh, it has one electron. So this will be potassium with one electron, and then calcium with another electron, and then what comes after? So argon's 18 electrons, so this is 19 electrons, 20 electrons, what has 21 electrons? 
element SC. Element SC is called scantium. scantium. And so we'll stop here for a second. This would be scantium. Scandium. Scandium, as far as an energy level diagram, it looks something like this. As far as electron configurations, we'll do this. We're going to call it argon, 4s2, and we're going to combine it with 3d. This is going to be 3d1. We could do the same thing with a 3d, you know. We have different letter configurations like this. So we have px, py, pz, px, P, Y, P, Z. The same thing with the Ds. We're going to have D, X, Y, referring to planes rather than axes. So this is X, Y plane. D, X, Z, D, Y, Z, D, X squared minus Y squared, D, Z squared. So these are letter designations for each of these orbitals. Um, and I'm, I can't remember if they match. So the minus two matches one of these, minus one matches another, et cetera. But we're not going to, we're just going to combine them all together and come up with the most compact thing. So this is the um, electron configuration for scandium using the abbreviation, or uh, we can do it more complete. So this would be quite compact. More complete, we'd start off at 1s. It would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So here's the first shell is filled, the second shell is filled, third shell is filled. And then we go to 4s2, 3d1. We can expand it out as well if we wanted to. 1s2, 2s2, 2px2, 2py2, 2pz2, 3s2, 3px2, 3py2, 3pz2, 4s2, 3dxy, it doesn't matter which one I choose, just pick one of them, 3dxy1, let me expand it out. Or we could draw it as an orbital box diagram. Or, orbital box diagram is good because it shows us, you know, the electrons that are paired and unpaired. So we go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. 3p, 4s, 3d, 3d. The orbital box diagram, or we'll have the full energy model diagram, which would look like this. So. So different ways of representing it for scandium. So um, what we do is uh, this. Sometimes we'll rearrange this. So do you see it goes 4s2, 3d1. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll arrange it in alphabetical order. So it goes argon, 3d1, 4s2. So we'll just flip those. The reason we flip these is um, so we can divide the electrons up into the outer electrons versus the inner electrons. The outer electrons are going to be defined as the highest n value. So what's the highest n value? The highest n value is 4. The inner electrons are just the 
other n values that we have. The inner electrons are also called the core electrons. The outer electrons are called the valence electrons. The valence electrons are more susceptible to attack by an oxidizer. So um, let's look at scandium. If I look at scandium, I'm going to have a 3D orbital. 3D orbital is uh, this clover leaf kind of shape, four leaf clover. So that's my 3D. And the 4S orbital, what shape is the S orbital? Spherical. Is uh, the 4S orbital bigger, smaller, or the same size as the 3D orbital? It's bigger. If an N equals 3 is about 9 times bigger than an N equals 1, then N equals 4 is going to be about how many times bigger than n equals 1? 16. 16. So this is 9 times bigger. The 4s is going to be about 16 times bigger, and it's going to be spherical. This will be the 4s. So do you see why we call the 3d the inner? The inner because they're closer to the nucleus. And we call the 4s the outer because it's further from the nucleus or has the possibility of being further, even though it's lower in energy. You know, in terms of energy, the 4s is closer in terms of energy. But in terms of distance, the 4s is further. Well, how can it be further and lower in energy? It has to do with the shape and the shape of the probability cloud. I'm not going to get into it. But let's say you're an oxidizer. If you're an oxidizer, which electrons are going to be easiest to take? The inner electrons or the outer electrons? If you're an oxidizer and you're trying to take electrons from scandium, you're going to take them from the outer orbital or the inner orbital? The outer. And so what happens here is an oxidizer comes along, the oxidizer is not going to attack the 3D. It doesn't attack the 3D because those are much closer to the nucleus. Instead, it's going to attack the 4S, which has a higher probability of being further out from the nucleus. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird because there's one other thing, which we aren't going to talk about in, in this slide. And so this, if you're an oxidizer, this is the way you'd approach it. First, you're going to take the 4S electrons. If you take the 4S electrons, well, once those are gone, then the outer muscle will be the 3D, and you'll take those. And so if you're an oxidizer, it depends on how many electrons you want. If you only want two electrons, then this is perfect. We'll take the two electrons from the 4s. If we take two electrons from the 4s, that, that means scandium is going to be two electrons short. Each electron is negatively charged. That means scandium will be plus two. So one charge we expect for scandium is plus two because if an oxidizer comes along, it takes these two electrons, we end up with plus two. But then that leaves the 3D exposed, and the oxidizer can come along and take those. So if an oxidizer comes along and takes the S first, and then the D, then what's the charge on scandium? Well, it's lost three electrons. If it loses three negative charges, it's going to be plus three. And so, um, so the common charge we expect for scandium is plus two and plus three. Here. In reality, though, scandium, it's easy to go all the way to plus three. If an oxidizer comes along, it takes these two first, and then it doesn't have much trouble with the third one here. But it's going to have trouble with argon because that's filled. And once you fill those shells, you don't want to break them apart. And so it's going to stop here. So scandium should stop at plus three. It shouldn't go beyond that. Does that make sense? Somewhat? Okay. All right, let's go to, uh, after scandium, we add one more electron, and then we have titanium. So let's take a look at titanium here. I'm not going to draw the whole energy level diagram. It's a lot to draw. So I'm going to just say up to here, the third shell is going to be argon. And so let's just write out the fourth shell, which will be 4S, followed by the 3D, which are going to be higher in energy. 
followed by the four P. And this will complete the fourth shell here. So scandium has two electrons in the 4S, one electron in the 3D. Titanium will have two electrons in the 3D. And so the second electron is going to go where? Well, it's going to go into any, any one of these four empty ones, according to Hunt's rule. And it's going to be parallel spin. So this would be it. So for titanium, um, we're going to have argon, which is 18 electrons. So this is 19, 20, 21, 22. Titanium has 22 electrons. All the other element number 22. And its electron configuration is going to look like this. So the energy level diagram looks like this. The electron configuration is going to be 4s2, 3d2. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip these around and make it argon, 3d2, 4s2. So if you're an oxidizer, you're going to attack the 4s electron first. So this will be the outer or the valence electrons. And this will be the inner or core electrons. So here, um, plus two if we lose those two. We could go to plus three if we lose one of those, or plus four ultimately. But we aren't going to go to plus five because we aren't going to break up argon, that configuration. So I'd expect plus two, plus three, and plus four to be charges for titanium. Does that make sense? Yeah. After titanium comes vanadium. Vanadium has 23 electrons. So we'll look at argon, which is 18 electrons. And then 4s2 would be 1920. And then 3d. I mean, 3D3. 3D3. And 4P are empty. So, looking at vanadium, we have argon. 4S2, 3D3. 4. Argon. Do this numerical order. 3D3. 4s2. So for vanadium, what are the expected charges? Um, the expected charges I, I expect are plus two, we lose these two. Plus three, we lose one of those. Plus four, we lose two of those. Plus five, we lose all of these. If we go to plus five, vanadium plus five, so losing, losing five is not easy. So it's going to be stabilized in some way. But plus five is an oxidation state that you find with vanadium. Okay. Can you do chromium? It's 24 electrons. Okay. Try that. Do this. And so for chromium, there's 24. So 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Is that what you get? And so what this means is the electron configuration in compact form is going to be argon, 4s2, 3d4. But um, what's observed is this. This is what's expected. What's observed is that the 4s electron gets promoted to a 3d here. This is what's observed. And so the observed electron configuration is argon, 4s1, 3d5. And then 4P is uh, empty. This 
So we get argon, 4s1, 3d5. Why is that? Uh, so the explanation goes like this. There's a certain stability, you know, symmetry to this. This is a half-filled subshell. A half-filled subshell is going to have some additional stability. Subshell or sublevel. Those two terms are used interchangeably. Sublevel. And so the way to think about it is, is like this. Let's say you have a, a two-layer cake. Okay, let's remove one of the layers and just look at the bottom layer here, the cake. So two-layer cake, this would be D, and it's all filled. This would be a filled D subshell or sublevel. If we half fill it, it's going to look like this. Like that. So there's a certain symmetry about that. Now, if we remove a slice of that from here, we'll just take a slice of cake out of here, then um, we end up with something like this. And so we're one slice away from filling this, half filling this. And so there's additional stability gotten from this half filled versus this the partially half-filled subshell. And it depends on how you cut things in half. You know, this is half-filled, it, it shows additional stability. However, if you cut the cake like this, you have, so this is half the cake here, and we cut off this half here. And then we remove that. This would be something equivalent to this. There's not gonna be stability in this. So we have half the cake, the right side here, the left side is empty. So this is not stable. And so it depends on how we have to fill it. And so this is stable, additional stability. And so the, the argument goes like this. It's going to cost you a little bit of energy to promote the electron from an S to a D, because D is higher in energy. But you get that energy back when you stabilize it from this to this, this is going to be a little higher in energy relative to, to this. And so this is going to result in an unusual electron configuration for chromium. What's observed is argon, 4s1, 3d5. This is what's observed. For chromium. And so this is one of the exceptions you're supposed to know. Well, um, go back to what was before chromium? Vanadium. What was vanadium? Yeah, the electron configuration for vanadium. Yeah, if you recall, vanadium is argon, 4s2, 3e3. So for vanadium, what we should do is we should promote two electrons. Because if we promote two electrons, then we can half fill the D. We get 3d5. But the problem with this is um, it costs too much energy. Promoting one electron is okay. But promoting two electrons is too costly in terms of energy, and it destabilizes things. And so here, this is observed. 
we don't promote. And so we can promote one, but not two. We can promote one electron, not two. And so there's no benefit in promoting just one because then we're left with this, the D4 type configuration. Okay, after chromium is what? After chromium is manganese. Uh, manganese is going to have a total of 25 electrons. So argon is going to take 18. 4s, 1, 2, that's 1920. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That gives us 25 electrons in 3d. The 4p there are none. And so this is half filled here. In terms of um, the electron configuration, it's going to be argon, 4s, 2, 3d, 5. Or we could flip it around to argon, 3d5, 4s2. So we're going to successively larger orbital. What do you think a common charge for manganese is? Common charge for manganese is the 4s electrons get attacked first. Those are like 16 times bigger orbitals than the 3d. And so if we lose both of those, plus two, we're missing two negative charges. So we end up with a plus two charge. And in fact, you only expect plus two, right? Because you don't want to disrupt this half fill. So plus two should be common, but plus three can also happen. Plus three, if the oxidizer is hungry enough, it can take another electron or two or more. In fact, um, if the oxidizer is hungry enough, it could take up, take a max of how many electrons? So seven plus seven. But so plus two and plus three, you know, and plus two being probably more common. Okay, after manganese, we have iron. Iron is going to be argon, 4s2, 3d6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the four p's are going to be empty there. As are the higher energy orbitals. So this is 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. 26 electrons. The electron configuration for this is going to be argon, 4s2, 3d6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or argon, 3d6, 4s2. So one of the common charges for iron is plus 2. Plus 2 means we lose the 4s electrons here. So the oxidizer comes along and it pulls off the outermost electrons. Once those are gone, then the outermost electrons will be D. One of the D electrons will be easier to take. This one here. Do you see that? Because we have electron-electron repulsion. Both electrons are negatively charged. So that's going to help the oxidizer remove that. And so if we remove the S and one of the Ds, that's plus 3. In fact, plus 3 should be a very common charge for iron, and it is. How about plus 4? No. Now, plus 4, 1, we're going to break up the half-filled symmetry, and 2, it gets harder and harder to remove electrons. So plus 2 and plus 3 are very common for iron. Iron plus 3 would just be 4s0, 3d5. Iron plus 2 would just be 4s0, 3d5. Six.
And then um, we continue on. Cobalt. And then after cobalt comes nickel. So let's jump to nickel next. Uh, why don't you do the energy level diagram, the abbreviated energy level diagram for nickel? So it'd be argon, 4F, 3D, 4P, and then fill them. Just focusing on the fourth cell. So argon's 18 electrons, so we 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. How many electrons do you have now? 28. 28 electrons like this. Now half-filled subshells have some stability, but filled subshells have quite a bit more stability, like a filled D. Here, I'm getting to the point where if I can promote these two electrons, I can fill this D subshell. A filled D subshell is going to have additional stability. Um, more than a half-filled D subshell. But promoting those two electrons is going to be cost prohibitive, so we'll just leave it like this. And so this would be nickel. So nickel, um, the electron configuration would be argon, 4s2, 3d2468, 3d8. Or argon, 3d8, 4s2. So what's a common charge for nickel? A common charge for nickel is plus 2. Another one's plus 3. You know, but as you get higher and higher, plus 4, plus 5, it gets harder and harder. So plus two, plus three are the most common charges for nickel. Cobalt is the same thing, plus two, plus three. Which is before I skip that. But let's go to copper next. Copper has 29 electrons. And so argon is going to take care of 18 of those. Argon is going to be okay, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15, 18. These first three shells. So we get a 4s, 2, 19, 20, and 3d, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 3d. I'm just one electron short of filling my 3d. So if I'm only one electron short, then this is what happens. Do you know what happens? If you're only one electron short between half filling the D or filling the D subshell, we're going to promote. And so if we promote it, then um, what it's going to look like is this. And so we'll promote that. We're going to get our argon core 4s, in this case 4s1. And then 3D over here. 
10. 1, 2, 3, 12, 10. And then 4P is empty. So here, for copper, we get argon, 4S1, 3D10. And so what we had to do is we had to promote the S electron to fill the D subshell. And so the filled subshell is favorable. There's going to be additional stability associated with that. And so here, this is going to be argon, 3D10, 4S1. So what's a common charge for copper? Plus 1, if we lose that, and also plus 2. Plus 2 is going to screw up my D. Why would I want to screw up the D by going copper plus 2? There's reasons for that, uh, which we aren't going to get into until Chem 1B. So we'll just leave it like this. Is that one copper? Didn't that fill it? Wasn't it like copper plus 1 was more stable than plus 2? No, copper plus 2 is more stable. There's a weird reason for that. Yeah. But silver, silver has a very similar electron configuration to copper, but silver is always plus 1. Zinc works out nicely. Let's look at uh, after copper comes zinc with 30 electrons. And so argon is going to take out 18, and we have 4s, 1, 2, 3d, 10. Gives us um, this is 18, 20, 30, 30 electrons. 4p. And so zinc is going to be argon 4s2 3d10 or argon 3d10 4s2. If we look at the inner electrons, it will have the argon core plus 3d10. Those are the inner core electrons. And then if we look at the outer, this will be the valence electron. Here, the outer electron. So what's the common charge for zinc? Well, plus two, for sure. If zinc loses two electrons, then we're left with argon 3d10. And in the case for zinc, we don't want to break out the 3d10. That has additional stability here. And so there's only one charge for zinc. What's the one charge for zinc? Plus two. Be zinc. After zinc comes what? Gallium. So let's go ahead and go ahead. This gallium has uh, another one more electron. Where does that one electron go? 4P. It's going to go in the 4P. So this would be gallium. Gallium is going to be argon. 4F2, 3D10, 4P1. And the way we rearrange gall gallium is like this. This is equivalent to argon, 3D10. This would be the inner for core. 4F2, 4P1. This would be the outer or valence. So when we're looking at gallium, it seems like plus one would be a charge. Plus one, we lose a p electron, 4p. Uh, or if the oxide is still hungry for electrons, we could lose these two as well. And so gallium, a common charge for gallium is plus three. We lose all the valence electrons here, leaving the core inner electrons. So the Ds we don't touch on gallium. After gallium, what comes next? This would be gallium. After gallium is going to come germanium. Germanium is 
one of those areas is going to be this argon 3n. Now we don't want to touch these. That's going to be filled shell and filled subshell. And then we have 4s. Well, that's a filled subshell, but the s subshell is not that significant compared to this. S subshell we can break apart. And then we'll have 4p2. So if we look at germanium, what are some common charges for germanium? The common charges would be plus 2 if we lose these, plus 4 if we lose all four of these. So plus 2 and plus 4 we expect for germanium. Well, um, germanium is in the same family as tin. Here. And so what are the common charges for tin? 2 and 4. What are the common charges for lead? 2 and 4. And so we can see that it's because, as we'll see, all members of the family will have the same kind of valence, valence shell electron configuration. And so germanium is 4s2, 4p2. Tin is going to be 5s2, 5p2. Lead is going to be 6s2, 6p2. And so they're all similar, they're just one shell higher. And so plus two and plus four is common for germanium. After germanium comes arsenic. If we look at arsenic, arsenic is going to be argon, 3d10. So we don't want to touch these. These are the inner electrons. But the outer electrons, we can ionize. And those are the Arsenic is going to be 4s2, 4p3. One more electron. And so what do you think some common charges for arsenic are? If we lose these, it would be plus 3. Or if we lose all of them, it would be plus 5. So for arsenic, plus 3 and plus 5 should be common. Antimony? plus 3 and plus 5. Bismuth, plus 3 and plus 5. Phosphorus, plus 3 and plus 5. Nitrogen, plus 3 and plus 5. Do you see that, that family? Uh-huh. For germanium, why wouldn't we promote the 4S electron to 4P? Um, because it's not going to have as much significance here. That's a good question. You would think we could promote this to half-fill um, this in germanium, but a half-filled P doesn't have quite the same significance as a half-filled D. So and the half-filled S is insignificant. It doesn't really matter if it's half-filled or not half-filled. And so it, it's primarily uh, the D orbitals that are most impacted. The P and the S orbitals aren't. And it just goes with the uh, quantum mechanics of that. And so this is a good point, but it's not going to happen here. Um, number two um, is the 4P is a more significant jump in energy versus the 4S and the 3D, which are closer in energy here. So it's going to cost even more energy, and it's not going to be worth it from the stabilization point of view. And so we'll never see a promotion for any other orbitals other than what we just talked about. Okay, um, well, germanium is um, kind of at this spot where, um, you know, instead of losing these to get this, what we could do is we could just try to fill this fourth shell. We're getting close to filling the fourth shell. So when we're at germanium, how many more electrons will it take to fill the fourth shell? The fourth shell will be 4s, 3d, 4p. It, it's only going to take four more electrons. And so one thing that germanium can do is it can lose four here, or it can gain four. If it gains four, it fills the fourth shell. Same thing with carbon, silicon, tin, and lead. When we go to arsenic, we could lose five and be left with this. This is fairly stable. It's filled shell, filled subshell. Or we could gain. Arsenic's a little bit closer. How many does it have to gain to fill that shell? Three. 
So if arsenic gains three more electrons, we get 3D10 force 2, 4P6. That fills all the subshells in the fourth shell, which means it's going to be or have additional stability due to that. And so when we go from arsenic, uh, the next one would be selenium. Selenium would be argon, 3D10, 4S2, 4P4. So for selenium, you know, we could go plus 4 or plus 6. Or we could go minus 2. If we go minus 2, that gains 2 electrons. So the common charge for selenium I would expect would be plus 4, plus 6, minus 2. Probably minus 2 would be the most common because it seems like it'd be more profitable just to gain 2 electrons to fill the fourth shell than to lose these. Go back to this. After selenium comes um, bromine. Bromine is only one electron short. It's going to be 3D10, 4S2, 4P5. And so here it would be much more profitable to just gain one extra electron and fill the shell, 4S2, 3D10, 4P6. And then finally, from bromine, we go to krypton. Krypton fills it. And so that would be argon. And I'll just write it in the normal way, 4S2, 3D10, 4P6, so we fill the shell. When we fill that shell, then we just call it krypton in square brackets. And that would be the filled shell. Filled first shell, filled second shell, filled third shell, filled fourth shell. So we've got. All right, so what we'll do is we'll take a break right now and then. Um, um, here. We have the periodic table, um, and the periodic table was originally organized based on properties, observations. But here, what we can see is we can see that the organizational structure of the periodic table um, goes in line with the orbitals. And so, in, so if we look at the first uh, row here, the first row is called the first shell or the first period. In the first shell, we just have one orbital, one s orbital. The one s orbital takes two electrons to fill. So this would be hydrogen, that would be helium. So once we fill the first shell, we can move on to the second shell. The second shell begins with 2s. And to fill this, would take a total of eight more electrons, or 10 electrons total. That will give us to neon. The third shell has the 3s and the 3p orbitals, which would take another eight electrons. And so that would give us 18 electrons. That would be argon. The fourth shell would consist of the 4s, the 3d, and the 4p. And so if we're only doing the first seven shells, actually six shells or seven shells, we can just use the periodic table to figure out the order. We don't have to use that other pattern here. And so this is what we're just looking at, the fourth shell, uh, filling it across here all the way to Krypton. And okay, if you look on this, take a look at this diagram and what do you see there? This is the energy level diagram, but there's a problem with this energy level diagram. The problem with this one is the spacing. There should be a big jump between the 1s and the 2s here. And the small jump from the 2s to the 2p, but it's the same magnitude of jump. And so this energy level diagram is more like an orbital box diagram that's been oriented vertically. So this isn't as useful. What you need to know is the energy level diagram that looks like uh, what I just had up there. This. And so. You could use boxes instead of lines here, that's fine, but the spacing is important uh, as an energy level diagram here. Um, it's not evenly spaced. Enough. We lose that information in an orbital box diagram. Just shown back here. Okay, so 
Okay, so something like this, you, you don't necessarily have to, to memorize because we can get this from the periodic table. So that's the fourth shell. What does the fifth shell consist of? The fifth shell consists of 5s, 2, 4d, 2, 5p. The sixth shell consists of 6s. Now the sixth shell is tricky because once we're at 6s, let's take a look here. That'll be six rows down. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's C in here. So we go six S to now the double asterisk here. The double asterisk means insert these in there. And so I actually go six S to four F here. This is three D, four D, five D, to five D to six P. And so that would be the sixth shell. The seventh shell would do a similar thing. So we draw, we go sixth shell would be 6s to 4f, jump back up here to 5d to 6p. And then we're on the seventh shell. The seventh shell is going to go 7s, and here they have an upside down triangle over there showing it. So we'll go 7s to 5f here to 6d to what comes next here? They don't show up, but what's next? 7D. So this 7D. That would complete the seventh shell. And so we can get that from the periodic table. The seventh shell goes from 7S to 5S to 6D to 7P. And then we start with the eighth shell. The eighth shell would be starting with 8S. So we go 8S to 5G. 6F to 7D to 8P, and then stop there. So the periodic table gives us the first six or seven shells easily from, from there. And so we don't necessarily have to use this. We only use this when we want to get the higher and higher shells figured out. And then it's easy to figure out using this. So a lot of the electron configurations, we can just get off or read off the periodic table. So let's take a look at uh, reading at electron configurations. Sorry. Yeah. A couple of electron configurations off the periodic table. So if we go to uh, molybdenum, uh, element number 42 here is 42 electrons. What would the electron configuration for molybdenum be? So what I do is I, I um, have to fill the first, the second, the third, and the fourth shell to get the molybdenum, because molybdenum is in the fifth shell. So if we fill the fourth shell, that's going to take me to krypton. That's with 36 electrons. So I go krypton, and then this would be fifth shell. So 5s1, 5s2, the 4d, 41, 42, 43, 44. So molybdenum should be krypton 5s2 4d4. That's what it should be. So molybdenum, I go krypton 5s2 4d4. And um, there's another set, the 5p are empty. So if they're empty, I'll just leave them off. But do you see something about molybdenum? Look at the D. What do you notice about the D? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the same family as krypton. And so what did krypton do? Krypton promoted one of its S electrons to the D. And so molybdenum is in the same boat. Molybdenum is going to promote one of the S electrons into the D. So we end up with 4D5, half-built D subshell. Same type of situation. So we can see um, MO here, molybdenum. We can take a look at the electron configuration.
Um, they wrote a different pair. They put uh, subscripts instead of the superscript. But it would be Krypton 5S1 4D 5. So we have to build it. So if that's um, molybdenum, what about tungsten? What do you think about, do you think tungsten should do the same thing? It should, you know, uh, considering it's in the same family. And so if we go to tungsten, tungsten's a bit more complicated. And so let's take a look at tungsten here. Or maybe I'll put it up there. I'll put it up here. Yeah, yeah. So if I look at tungsten, uh, which is element number 74, what shells have we filled? So first shell, second shell, third shell, fourth shell, and fifth shell. You see that? So if we fill the fifth shell, then we're at xenon. So we use the square brackets and xenon abbreviation. So we start off with xenon, otherwise we have to write it all out. And then we go from xenon to 55. So this would be 6s1, 6s2. 6s2, and then look at what happens here. We go from 56 to 57 down here. They broke it apart here. There's just not enough room to insert this here and have a decent periodic table. So we have to follow the asterisk down here. So we go 6s2, 4f1 through 14. So we go 4f14, that takes us to 70, and then we'll go back to 71. 71 is going to be um, this 3D, 4D, 5D, 5D1, 5D2, 5D3, 5D4. So it'd be xenon, 6S2, 4S14, 5D4. Well, 5, or 6D, I mean, sorry, 5D, yeah, 5D4. 5D4, that's only one electron shy of uh, half filling that orbital. And so let's take a look at tungsten here, the electron configuration. Constant. <clears throat> so what we predicted was, okay, this is xenon. Um, this is written in the other order. It would go 6s2, 4f14, 5d4. And we would expect to promote a 6s electron to the d, but it didn't happen here. And so what, what happens is there are going to be more and more exceptions, and you just have to realize that. There are more and more exceptions as we get deeper and deeper into the periodic table. And so um, we're not going to worry about it too much here for tungsten. Even though tungsten is what predicted it to do the same thing as chromium and molybdenum, it didn't. So things are a little bit more complicated. All right, let's look at another one here. Um, and the same thing doesn't happen with the 4F. So if we have filled with 4F, we don't. It's primarily the Ds. All right, let's look at the electron configuration. Which one do you want to do? Yeah. Uranium? We'll do uranium element number 92 here. So this is a little bit complicated because this actually is what shell? This is double asterisk. This must be in the seventh shell. So to fill the sixth shell takes us to Rn. Rn is what element? Radon. Radon's radioactive. It's a gas. The primary danger with radon is inhaling it. And so we start with radon, and then we go to 7s1, 7s2. 
and then where? 5F, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, actually 5F, 1, 2, 3, that's actually pretty simple, 5F, 4. And so uranium should be radon, 7S2, 5F4, that's what it should be. We can always check. Look it up. There are periodic tables with this on. The electron configurations printed on the periodic table itself. Okay, gloves are those neoprene gloves. Yeah, these aren't like lead line gloves. This must be depleted uranium. Yeah. Hopefully it's lost a lot of its radioactivity because gloves like this aren't going to protect you from the radiation from there. All right, so what did we get? They got radon. We predicted 7s2, 5s4. What they got is 7s2, 61, 5s3. You know what happened here? They used, uh, there are two periodic tables that you'll find. Take a look at this periodic table here. Look at the numbering on this periodic table here. The number goes like this. 88, where's 89? 89 is here. So we go 7s2, 5f, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it goes 88, 89. Okay, that's uh, that periodic table. Let's take a look at Another periodic table. Take a look at this periodic table. This periodic table, do you see the difference here? Look at 87, 7s1, 88, 7s2. But where's 89? In the other periodic table, 89 was down here. In this periodic table, it's here. So whatever periodic table we use, we just follow it. And so this is the periodic table. Actually, this is the periodic table that people typically use. So if we're looking at uranium, this is what we do. It goes 7s1, 7s2, and then this is 3d, 4d, 5d, 6d. And so this goes 7s2, 6d1. That takes us to 89, but where's 90? 90s down here. 90s and 5F. 5F1, 5F2, 5F3. So if we use this periodic table, we'll get this electron configuration. The electron configuration is 7S2, 6D1, 5F3. You see that? If we use the other periodic table, this is the electron configuration we get. The um, the other periodic table is going to give us this because where's 89? 89's in the 5F. And so here we don't go to 3, 4, 5, 6. We don't go to 6D until we're already finished with this. And so the filling goes like this. And so what we do is um, we don't want to keep track of all these exceptions. We'll just use the periodic table and use the periodic table to tell us how it fills. The only exceptions that you're going to have to be aware of are chromium and copper. I talked about copper already, right? I'm going to get the fill of D subshell, and then you'll be all right. And then if copper is an exception, so will be silver be. Silver is going to be krypton rather than 5s2, 4d9. It would be 5s1, 4d10. And that gives some silver 
it's plus one. Silver behaves more as expected than copper does. We have silver is going to be um, krypton, 5s1, 4d10, or krypton, 4d10, 5s1, which gives us one valence electron. What's the most common charge? In fact, what's the only charge for silver? Silver is fixed charge. The only charge for silver is plus, plus one. one. Plus one means we lose that single valence electron there. And so it behaves as you'd expect. Can you go back to uh, uranium real quick? Uh -huh. um, what was the one we agreed? There are two electron configurations depending on what periodic table you get. If you get this periodic table, you would say radon, 7s2, 4f, 5f, 7s2, 5f1, 5f2, 5f3, 5f4. So if you're given this periodic table and you want uranium, you do radon, 7s2, 5f4. Not the 16. Not the 16. That's um, because there are two, two ways the periodic table is organized. Um, however, if you're given this periodic table, then it's radon, 7s, 2, and then where's 89? Here, in the 6d. So it goes 7s, 2, 6d, 1. 5F3. Which one is it? Um, the observed uh, electron configuration, and why is it? Why do we just put one D electron there and then start putting the F? And it just turns out, once we get to these higher and higher energy levels, the spacing gets more and more compact. And so there's more overlap and more exceptions there because the energy difference between the subshells is minimal, so you're going to find more exceptions there. That's typically the way it's thought of. And so just follow the numbers. Whatever the numbers are, uh, you just follow those, and then you just look at um, this. You look at how the uh, orbitals are ranged. Yeah. So if you know this, then you're fine. You know, first shell, second shell, third shell, fourth shell. Uh-huh. Um, can you go back to the periodic table real quick? Just one of the other questions. Which one? Um, either one, I guess. Okay. So for uranium, oh, I see, it falls back to radon, because I was wondering why it wouldn't be, what is that on? Did you, this one? 118. 118? Yeah, I, I think I answered that question. Okay. Why does it fall back to this one? Yeah, when you're... Yeah, because this is in the, we only partially fill the seventh shell. We completely fill the sixth shell, and we partially fill because uranium is only partway through the seventh shell. It's, it's kind of weird. You have to insert that there. Okay. So this is the organization of the periodic table um, in terms of shells. And uh, here's some orbitals. You might see this too. Do you see the color coding on the orbitals? Blue, yellow. The color coding depends on the amplitude of the wave function. So we can have positive amplitude above and a negative amplitude below. And so this goes, um, let's see, blue is positive. So it goes positive amplitude here to negative, through zero to negative amplitude. When it passes through zero, that's called a node. 
And so blue is positive. This is positive amplitude, then it goes through zero, and then goes negative amplitude, which is yellow, and then goes back up to zero to positive amplitude, which is blue, where then drops back down through zero, negative, positive, negative. So this is positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. These are this is a P orbital. It's a really complicated P orbital. It's a really complicated P orbital because it has nodes. We have different kinds of nodes where it goes through zero amplitude. And um, this one's called a planar node. This is a normal P orbital, but this is a 2P. The 3P has an additional node in there. That's something called a spherical node. The nodes we aren't going to talk much about. There, and this. And this is why the orbitals can look quite complicated here. Um, these, you know what these patterns are? These are called periodic trends. So here's a graph of some periodic trends. More periodic trends. More periodic trends. We're going to look at some of these periodic trends here you know, as we go across a shell. So this, uh, this continues. You know where the smallest atoms are? <laughs> Smallest atom would be uh, helium. Biggest atom should be francium. Francium, that's correct. And so how would be a periodic trend? You have fran francium, which would be the biggest, but francium is radioactive, and then you have helium, which would be the smallest. And so the periodic trend is like this. It gets bigger as we go down and left. It gets smaller as we go up and right. Okay, why does it get smaller as we go to the right? And so the size decreases as we go left to right. And so let's just look at the first shell. If you look at the first shell, the first shell just consists of two elements, hydrogen filling the first shell. Hydrogen, which has one electron in the 1s orbital. Helium has two electrons in the 1s orbital. Now, is the 1s orbital the same size for hydrogen and helium? You would think so. I mean, it's the 1s orbital. You would think they would be the same size. But do you know that they're actually different size? In fact, um, helium should be bigger. You know, if I look at the 1s orbital, will the 1s orbital on helium be bigger? Smaller or the same size? Smaller. It's going to be smaller. And um, the reason it's going to be smaller is, well, small atom, but it's got more positive charge. And that greater positive charge is going to have like a tractor beam effect on the electrons. It's going to pull the electrons closer. And that means electrons can't get too far away, not unless they have a lot of energy. And so the one is orbital on. Helium is a lot smaller than the 1s orbital on um, hydrogen. And so the, the reason we say that size decreases going left to right is because we have increasing nuclear charge. The more protons we have, how about lithium? How about the 1s orbital on lithium? Is it going to be bigger than the 1s orbital on helium? Smaller? Or the same size? Smaller. It's even smaller. So lithium's got three protons, so the 1s orbital is even smaller. And therefore, lithium should be smaller atoms, shouldn't it, than hydrogen and helium. But do you know lithium um, is not a smaller atom? Lithium is a bigger atom than hydrogen and helium. Why is that? 
because the size depends not on the 1s orbital size, it depends on the entire thing. So lithium, um, yes, it has a 1s orbital, but it also has a 2s orbital. And a 2s orbital is about how many times bigger than a 1s orbital? It's like four times bigger. So what it turns out, what turns out to happen is uh, a lithium, because we have to look at the whole thing, is bigger than both of these. Hydrogen is smaller. And so the size decreases as we go up. And so we have decreasing size as we go up because we have fewer shells. Lithium, we're filling the second shell here. And whereas in hydrogen and helium, we're just filling the first shell. But as we go across, you know, we go from lithium to beryllium. Well, beryllium is in the same shell, but we have more protons. So uh, beryllium um, is smaller than lithium. It's four protons. And so we got the 2s orbital here. And so you just need to know the general size trend. Um, let's take a look at those here. They, I think they messed up the drawing here. Um, if you look at hydrogen and helium, which one should be smaller? Helium, but I think the graphic that I'll make. You see helium looks bigger, does it? The graphic got mixed up with the radius, didn't it? This is 37 picometers, helium is a radius of 31 picometers. So helium is smaller. And then we got a lithium. Lithium has a radius of 152 picometers, quite a bit bigger. Because now we're filling the next shell. Sodium is even bigger, even though it has more protons. Because we're filling the third shell now, fourth shell, etc. But as we go across, this is all in the same shell. So this is some third shell. If it's in the third shell, we're not adding a shell, we're not removing a shell. What we're doing though as we go across is we're adding more protons. As we more, add more protons, it has that kind of magnetic effect, that attractive field effect, and pulls in the electrons as we go across. So those are the general size trends here. The biggest atom on this is cesium here. Yeah, although you expect francium. There are some other things that happen here you know, as we go across. So for example, polonium we expect to be smaller than bismuth, but it's actually lower than it. So there are some exceptions to this. Polonium, etc. And so just know the overall or the general size pattern. Some of these stay flat. They don't show the transition elements in here. The transition elements do a weird thing with the size, but you can learn about that in Chem 1A. I'm not going to talk about it here. The next um, periodic trend we're going to look at is something called ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy it takes to remove the electron. So if we look at a neutral sodium atom, it has 11 protons and 11 electrons. We can ionize one of those, and then it ends up with 11 protons and 10 electrons. And we end up with an H plus. Which electron are we going to ionize? We're going to ionize the outermost electron. The outermost electron will be the valence electron. In this case, it's just 3s, there's one electron there. We're not going to touch the core. So this is 1s2, the helium spill, neon spill. So we call this neon. Core electron configuration. So sodium ions here. If we were to break apart this core, it would cost us significantly more energy. And the amount of energy. And so that doesn't happen. It costs too much energy to ionize it. So it's partially filled. If we were partially filled, it would be a lot easier to ionize. So we stop at sodium plus sodium ions. Well, how much energy did that take to remove that electron? 
For sodium, not that much. So sodium has something what we call low ionization energy. That electron can be lost pretty easily. Here's ionization energy plotted on the Y. So sodium is low. Same thing with lithium. Low ionization. Potassium is even lower, so it's even easier to ionize. Why? Because it's bigger. The bigger the atom, the easier it is to ionize. The smaller the atom, the harder it is to ionize. And so if you have a big atom like francium, then an oxidizer comes along, it's easy to take off because you know this electron is so far away from the nucleus. Whereas if you have an atom like helium, helium is really hard to ionize. In fact, what has the highest ionization energy out of all the elements? Out of all the elements, the highest ionization energy is helium. It's the hardest to ionize. And so the ionization energies follow the size trends. That is, we have increasing ionization energy as we go left to right. So the smaller the size, the smaller the size, the harder it is to take that electron. The bigger the size, the easier it is. And so as we go up in the periodic table, the ionization energy increases as the size decreases. And so helium is smaller than hydrogen. Helium is going to have a higher ionization energy. Then we go to lithium. Lithium is much bigger. So ionization energy goes down. Then we go to beryllium. Beryllium is smaller, harder to ionize. Boron is smaller, but easier to ionize. There's a weird blip here. That weird blip you need to know in, in Chem 1A, but in Chem 4, not really. This weird blip, though, we can um, determine what it's caused from. When we ionize lithium, that's coming from a 2s orbital. When we ionize beryllium, it's coming from a 2s orbital. When we ionize boron, it's coming from a 2p orbital. 2p electrons are easier to ionize than 2s electrons. And so this is why we see a drop here. And so um, when we go to carbon, carbon's smaller, and it's ionizing a 2p, so it's the same as boron, so it goes up. Then we go to nitrogen, ionizes a 2p, but when we get up from nitrogen to oxygen, it gets easier, even though oxygen is smaller. And the difference between nitrogen and oxygen here is that in nitrogen, you're ionizing an unpaired electron. In oxygen, you're ionizing a paired electron. So if we look at um, nitrogen, nitrogen is going to have the helium core, although this is probably more work than writing 1s2. Um, and then 2s2, 2p, there. So 1s2, 2s2. So nitrogen is going to look like this. So when we remove an electron, we're removing a 2p electron here. Now oxygen is smaller, so it should be harder to ionize. But it turns out that there's a that weird blip, and oxygen is actually easier to ionize. And so we go 1s2, fill the helium and 2s, 2, 2p, 4. Why do you think oxygen is easier to ionize even though it's smaller? It should be harder to ionize, but it turns out it's easier to ionize. Can you see why? Right. <laughs> because electrons are negatively charged. You have two electrons here together in one orbital. You have electron-electron repulsion. And so it turns out that this one's easier to remove because the electron-electron repulsion is going to give it a little push to get out. And so the ionization energy for oxygen is lower, even though it's smaller and should have higher ionization energy. Whereas this one, you know, there's no repulsion to help you ionize it. So that's the case here. But don't worry about that. But you see this blip repeated here. Magnesium is an S, aluminum is a P, so easier to ionize P orbital. Phosphorus, unpaired, sulfur paired. So losing the paired. But once it's paired, then the rest are the same. So we go to argon. And so we see this blip repeated here. But the overall trend is, you know, as we go across, 
the shell here, the atoms get smaller, the ionization energy goes up. So this is the first shell. This is the second shell. Ionization energy goes up as we go across. Third shell, fourth shell. Yeah. That's called the first ionization. This is just removing the first electron. We have um, second ionization, third ionization, etc., depending on how many electrons we have. And so here are some, um, we're going to look at these more later. Here are the names for different parts of the periodic table lanthanide, dactanide, yeah, subshell. And chemical properties. Chapters 11, 12, and 13, I'm going to kind of blend together. And so we'll look at some of these other things later. And so the next thing we're going to look at, okay, these are the elements. The next thing we're going to look at are, um, is bonding. You know, bonding between elements and bonding in compounds. And so here we have two different forms of phosphorus. In here we have white phosphorus, and this is underwater. Usually phosphorus is stored underwater to prevent it from reacting with oxygen and air. If oxygen and air um, comes into contact with white phosphorus, it starts to burn and combust. And the, the structure of white phosphorus forms these four-membered uh, cages of phosphorus atoms. Whereas red phosphorus doesn't have to be stored underwater. Red phosphorus has a different structure. It's these chains that are cross-linked here. This is red phosphorus. And so the difference in properties, these are totally different. I mean, white, red, totally different properties, different color, but the same element. The difference is how it's bonded together. And so what we're going to look at is bonding part one, which is chapter 12. So we know about the ions. We know how to predict the charges. Predicting the charges is based on electron configuration. So this is a table just going through the common charges and their electron configuration. We'll just look at a specific example of this you know, as far as electron configuration goes. We're going to take a look at sodium reacting to chlorine. Yeah. So the first thing um, is something called the Lewis symbol. Group one um, has the electron configuration. This is the valence called the valence shell electron configuration. So if we can ignore the core, the valence shell electron configuration is going to be NS1. That is, um, hydrogen will be 1s1, lithium is 2s1, sodium is 3s1, etc. So they all have one valence electron. Group 2 has two valence electrons, that would be ns2. And then we go over to 3a, these are going to be the a's here. If we go to 3a, then um, it's going to be ns2, np1, three valence electrons. 4A would be NS2, NP2. 5 would be NS2, NP3. 6 would be NS2, NP4. 7 would be NS2, NP5. And 8 would be NS2, NP6. H fill. And so this would be the noble gas electron configuration here. This would be the fill. So how many electrons does it take to fill the NS and the NP orbitals? It takes eight electrons. 
Well, when you have it filled with eight electrons, we call them octet. And octets are favorable because the filled shell um, lends additional stability. So what we'll have um, are Lewis symbols. So for example, it, let's look at the um, second shell. Lithium has one, what we call valence electron, we show that as a dot. And then beryllium has two, and we show it as a, two dots that are kind of paired like this. And then we go over here um, to uh, aluminum, no, boron. Boron has three dots. The three dots we write like this. Here. And then um, carbon has four dots, we write like this. And then nitrogen has five dots, where we pair one and have three singles. Oxygen has six dots. We'll pair two and two singles. And then um, fluorine has seven dots. Where we'll have three pairs and one single. And then finally, neon has eight dots, which will result in four pairs of dots. So these are the Lewis symbols. Now, how, if we pair it or unpair it, you know, what's the significance of that? And so it, it's not associated with, um, with this necessarily. So for example, this would be helium 2s1. Beryllium would be helium 2s2. So um, we'd have a pair of electrons in the 2s orbital. But when we go to boron, boron would be helium 2s2, 2p1. So we would have a pair in the 2s and a single in the, in the p. Where's my pair here? There's no pair here. We just have three singles in the Lewis symbol. Um, and so it's not associated. You know, this pairing and single is not associated with what we see in the energy level diagram. In the energy, energy level diagram, we'd have helium. And then the 2s would be paired in a single on the 2p. It shows one paired and one unpaired. I mean, one, two, two that are paired up and then one that's single. And the same thing with carbon. If we look at carbon, um, carbon electron configurations, helium 2s2, 2p2. 2s would be paired. However, the 2p, according to Hund's rule, should be single. Like that. And so this should be two singles and one pair, but the way I have it, four singles in the Lewis symbol. And so it's not correlated. These aren't correlated. Lewis symbols are typically written in this way for another reason. And so don't try to correlate them. It doesn't quite work. Neon's pretty well correlated. Fluorine's pretty well correlated. So. But the others don't necessarily have to be. Okay, if we look at boron, and boron is a long way from filling the shell. If I wanted to fill the second shell, how many more electrons would I need? Well, to fill it, I need five more electrons to fill the P. 2P6 would be full. Do you think boron can take five electrons from something? No. And so for something like boron, it'd probably be easier to lose three. And so boron, the common charge for boron is just lose these three valence electrons. The valence electrons are the highest n. Both of these have the same n, so we just group them together. Even though they're in different subshells, these are grouped together and we call it three valence electrons, and we can lose all three because if an oxidizer comes along, it will pull the 2p for sure first, but it can easily get the 2s's as well. Same thing over here. You know, to fill the shell, we need six more electrons. To fill this shell, we need seven more electrons. That's not going to happen. So for, for lithium, what's much easier to happen is lose one. If we lose that one, then we're just left with helium. Beryllium, easiest just to lose two. Boron, lose three. Carbon, we could lose... Well, we could lose two, or we could lose four. That could happen. Or for carbon, we might actually instead gain... How many? How many more do we need to get the octet? 
The octet would be eight electrons, so we'd need four more electrons to complete its octet. So carbon can lose two, can lose four, or can gain four. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is helium, 2s2, 2p3. So for something like nitrogen, nitrogen can lose three, it could lose five, all five, or can gain three. And so this is what gives nitrogen its range. Its range is gonna be from plus five oxidation state to minus three. Does lose all five or gain three? It could also go plus three. You know, it doesn't have to lose all five. Oxygen is the same thing, but once we get to something like fluorine, do you think fluorine is going to want to lose? No, fluorine doesn't lose. Fluorine just only gains. It's only one electron short of an octet, so we have 2s2, 2p5. So if we can bring that up to 2p6, then that would be good for chlorine. It would have an octet. Octet's good because it fills that shell. And so let's look at the reaction between sodium and chlorine here. So the Lewis symbol for sodium which is um, argon, 3s1, one valence electron. The Lewis symbol for sodium is just one dot there, one valence electron, plus chlorine. This is atomic chlorine. Atomic chlorine is going to be argon, 3s2, 3p5. So it's one electron short from an octet of eight electrons. And so chlorine, we're going to show us three pairs and one single. And so it just wants to pair up this. And so what's going to happen with this is uh, chlorine is going to take the electron from sodium. Sodium has a relatively low ionization energy, so it's not so hard to take that electron. That's going to leave up sodium without that outer electron, so it's going to have a positive charge. We use square brackets around the little symbol with our charge. And then chlorine's going to gain that electron here. So chlorine's going to get the octet. It's going to give it a negative charge here. And so sodium ion has an electron configuration of argon, or no, sorry, neon. What is argon here? Sodium, sodium is not argon, sorry. Sodium is neon. Neon is 10, sodium is 11. So I need to change this to neon. This is neon. 3S is correct. Though. And so this is um, going to leave me with neon for, and then over here, this is going to be neon. 3s2, 3p6. So neon fills the first two shells, and the 3s2, 3p6 fills the third shell. So the first, second, and third shell are filled, which means it's equivalent to argon. Yeah. Okay, this is what we call a formula unit. And this is the uh, Lewis structure for the ionic compound. But in reality, we have a lattice. And the lattice is going to look like this. Each sodium will want to surround itself with as many chlorides as possible. And each Chloride will want to surround itself with as many sodiums as possible.
So what we end up with is building in the uh, lattice structure like this. Here. What we call the crystal structure here. And so this is a three-dimensional lattice in sitting chloride. What's happening with the sizes? Um, an interesting thing happens with the size. Sodium is bigger than chlorine. Is there in the third shell? Chlorine's further to the right, so it's smaller. But when we make the ions, it inverts. So this would be sodium ion. Sodium ion is smaller than chloride ion. Okay. And so this is what happens here. When we're looking at sodium atom versus the chlorine atom, sodium's bigger, chlorine's smaller. They're in the same shell. Chlorine has 17 protons. Sodium has 11. And so that's that tractor beam. The chlorine's smaller. But when sodium loses an electron, the chlorine, then the size shrinks. And so when sodium will go from 11 protons and 12, I mean 11 protons and 11 electrons, to 11 protons and 10. So the size gets cut in half. And so sodium size gets cut in half when it loses an electron. And then chlorine size doubles when it gains an electron. So we can see. So when we form cations, the cations shrink by about half. And when we form anions, the anions grow by about double. And so the sodium is small, the gray ones, the chlorine, the green ones, the bigger ones. Okay. This is a lattice here. These are two different ways of representing the lattice structure. This is packed together. This is it where we spread it apart. Um, these lines just show how they're attached. We don't really draw lines between these. Um, what's holding these together is something called the ionic bond. The ionic bond is this. It's not really shown by any thing other than writing a positive next to a negative. The ionic bond is the contraction between positive and negative. So there are a whole bunch of ionic bonds in here that aren't really shown. This is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate has a different, slightly different structure because the carbonate ions are more complex shape. This is a carbonate CO3 2 minus. Calcium are this gray silver ones here. I have that lattice, I'll bring it in. Let's see. All right, that's ionic. Next thing we're going to look at is something called a uh, covalent um, bond here. Chlorine has no problem ionizing sodium. And chlorine wants one electron to fill its octet. So this is an ionic bond. Let's look at covalent bond. And I'll talk about what a covalent bond is in a minute. But ionic bond is just attraction between a positive ion and a negative ion. A covalent bond occurs like this. Let's say I have one chlorine here. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, 3s2, 3p5. It wants one more to get 3s2, 3p6 to complete its octet. And then I'll add it to another chlorine here. So both these chlorines want one electron. So both of them are going to attack each other. But who will win? Now, will the left chlorine win or will the right chlorine win? And it turns out that. Um, both win. Now, this is a win win type situation. And the win win type situation results in something that looks like this. It's not a total win, because chlorine would rather have an electron all to itself. But what chlorine has to do, now let's draw it like this, is chlorine ends up sharing the electron. We show the shared electrons as a single line. And so this is equivalent to chlorine, chlorine like this. <clears throat> and 
And so we get an octet, but it's not perfect, because chlorine would want all eight electrons for itself. Two of them it has to share, six of them has. Two of them has to share because we have to double count these two. So the left chlorine, those electrons belong to, and the right chlorine, those electrons belong to. And so they're shared in this way. And therefore, we can get an octet like this and like that. Ideally, chlorine wants it all to itself. And so it prefers to react with sodium versus itself. But since sodium is not around, it's going to have to just compromise uh, in this way. So this is called a covalent bond. And um, what holds an ionic bond together are the positive and negative attractions. What holds a covalent bond together, what holds the atoms in a covalent bond together, are the same thing. These are electrical attractions as well. We can see that in the case for hydrogen. Hydrogen is one electron short from, it's not an octet, but a duet, because the first shell only needs two electrons to fill. And so hydrogen is in the first shell. You can get those two electrons by sharing like this. So this hydrogen gets two. If we count, this line counts as two electrons. And this hydrogen gets two. So we fill the first shell for both hydrogens, but they have to share. If I look at hydrogen, it has a proton and then it has an electron. The electron we represent as a cloud because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us we're not going to pinpoint it. So we'll just have a cloud like this representing the density. And then we have another hydrogen here. And um, we have overlapping cloud density here. So when I look at this region in between, we see increased electron cloud density here in this region. And so we have like double the cloud density here in this region versus outside this region. So this is increased negative charge density because electrons are negatively charged. So increased negative charge density relative to outside here. Outside here, we don't have that increase. It's because of the overlap region here. So if there's more negative charge density here, that's going to hold the two nuclei together. There. And so the positive is going to be attracted to this negative here, this green region. And that's what's going to hold the covalent bond together. All right, so when um, chlorine tries to attack chlorine, it's going to result in a tie. When chlorine attacks sodium, then it, chlorine wins. Chlorine takes the electron. But let's, um, let's try chlorine here trying to attack hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is a much smaller atom than sodium. And so hydrogen is going to have a much higher ionization energy. And so hydrogen is going to be a lot harder to ionize than sodium was. And so chlorine is going to come and try to take the electron. Hydrogen could do likewise, like that. And so what we end up with is we end up with a sharing type scenario again. Because um, chlorine is not strong enough to completely strip or ionize hydrogen. And so we have a sharing situation like this. But the sharing is going to be a little bit different. You know, this is uneven sharing. Over there is even sharing. It's uneven sharing because chlorine has a stronger attraction for electrons than hydrogen. And so we can get an idea about this uneven sharing by looking at something called electronegativity. Electronegativity is this. We're going to have a tug of war for electrons. Electron tug of war. And the electronegativity is going to tell us how strong it is in the tug of war. And so let's take a look at electronegativity here. This is electromagnetic. 
table. The most electronegativity is fluorine. Now, electronegativity is ability to attract or pull electrons toward it. So fluorine has the strongest ability. Helium's electronegativity is way down here. Helium doesn't want any more electrons. Now, helium's already got knocked out. Neon is way down here. Argon is way down here. All the noble gases are way down here because they don't want. But fluorine wants an extra electron. And it pulls very hard. How hard does it pull? 4.0 hard. Now, francium has the lowest electronegativity. Francium really doesn't want electrons. Cesium is the same, rubidium. All these have extremely low electronegativities, like 0.7. 0.7 is the lowest. Okay, and electronegatives increase as we go left and up. I mean, not left, right and then up. So it follows the size terms as well. And so we can um, see the different scenarios here. When we have sodium and chlorine, and we end up in a tug of war for the electrons, what is sodium's electronegativity? EN is what we'll abbreviate it. So um, sodium has an electronegativity of 0.9, and chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.2. Um, which one's stronger, sodium or chlorine? Chlorine. Is a lot stronger. And so what we do is we look at something called delta En. <coughs> when we look at delta En, the difference in electronegativity is going to be 2.3, which is a significant difference in electronegativity. When we have a large difference in electronegativity, then winner takes all. Chlorine is much more powerful than sodium. And so all the electron cloud goes on to chlorine. It's not shared. And so this makes an ionic bond. The electrons are not shared. And so we have an arbitrary cut like this. For an ionic bond, we like a delta En of greater than about 2. If we have a delta E in greater than 2, that's going to be pretty ionic. This is a large difference. If we look at hydrogen, uh, what's the electronegativity for hydrogen? Hydrogen's weird. Do you see it? Yeah, it's 2.2. It's between boron and carbon right here. So it's 2.2. Chlorine, 3.2. And so when we form HCl, delta En is yeah, 1.0, which is not quite ionic. So it's somewhere between covalent and ionic. That's somewhere between um, covalent and ionic, it's called polar covalent. Polar covalent is like 1.9 to 0 0.6. And so we call this polar covalent. Does that mean covalent would be like less than or equal to 0.5? Yeah. Polar covalent is um, hydrogen doesn't completely let go. Sodium completely lost it. Hydrogen hangs on. Is hydrogen, but chlorine's still dominant. And so the cloud, there's still some attachment to the hydrogen, but the cloud is skewed towards chlorine here, but not completely on chlorine. And so this is called polar covalent. We have an asymmetric electron cloud like this. And then uh, chlorine versus chlorine. Chlorine is a 3.2 and chlorine is a 3.2, so it's going to be a tie. 
and we get a delta EN of zero. A delta EN of zero, what that means is that it's shared evenly. They both have the same pole. Versus this, it's not shared evenly, it's not even sharing. And so when we have something that's even sharing like this or close to it, we call it nonpolar covalent. It doesn't have to be perfect. But if it's close to it, we'll call it nonpolar covalent. What's close to it? Well, delta EN of zero for sure. But we can have a small difference in EN. And so for polar covalent, now these are arbitrary cutoffs. For nonpolar covalent, then we want a delta EN of 0.5 and to zero. So we got the delta in of zero there should be uh, non-polar covalent. It should be even sharing. So let's uh, categorize some bonds here. Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is 3.4, hydrogen is 2.2. So delta EN is 1.2. So a hydrogen-oxygen bond, is it going to be ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent? Polar covalent. Hydrogen sulfur, hydrogen is 2.2, sulfur is 2.6, delta EN is 0 0.4. 0 0.4 means it's non-polar covalent. Non it's not perfect, it's just slightly skewed from sulfur. Wow. But it's not significantly skewed, so we're just going to call it non-polar covalent. Um, hydrogen, 2.2. Phosphorus, 2.2. Delta EN is zero. This is perfectly non-polar. It's totally symmetric. And so this would be non-polar covalent. Hydrogen and carbon. Carbon is 2.6. Hydrogen is 2.2. Delta EN is 0.4. So a hydrogen-carbon bond we call... Nonpolar, polar, or ionic? Hydrogen, carbon. Nonpolar. You should know this. Hydrogen, carbon bonds are all nonpolar. In other words, hydrogen, carbon bonds form when we have hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are carbon and hydrogen containing compounds. And those are all nonpolar. The bonds, at least, are all nonpolar. Take a look at multiple bonds. Um, Let's look at oxygen. Oxygen is in group six. It has six valence electrons. The group tells us how many. Um, well, it's a little bit more trickier than that, but oxygen has six. So each oxygen wants to get two. So this oxygen is going to try to take two from this. This oxygen will try to take two from that. But there's, there's not going to be a winner and loser. It's going to be a win-win, but compromise win-win type situation in which there are going to be four electrons share. This just represents this. Yeah. Where each paradox is drawn as a line. This is called a double bond. Nitrogen is going to do the same thing because if nitrogen wants three, so if each nitrogen wants three, it'll try to take three from the other. And what's going to end up happening is it's going to share six, which is going to make a triple bond. Triple bonds are very strong. And so nitrogen is fairly stable because it's hard to break that triple bond. Double bonds are pretty strong too, uh, stronger than single bond. Let's 
we're almost out of time here. Um, oxygen can do that, but you know, oxygen can attack other things as well, rather than another oxygen. So for example, we can have oxygen which wants two, and it can take it from hydrogen as one. Oxygen's more electronegative, so we'll take that one and take this one here. And so we end up with H2O. Let's look at the electronegativities. Uh, the electronegativity of oxygen is on the previous slide. Okay. Is 3.4. So the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. So delta E M here is going to be 2.2, or no, not 2.2, 1.2. 1.2. What kind of bond is that? Polar covalent. What polar covalent means is that the electron cloud is skewed and unevenly distributed. In fact, um, oxygen is stronger in this tug of war, so it's going to pull more of the cloud, but hydrogen doesn't completely let go. The lone pair just belongs to itself. We see something like this. Here. So these are polar covalent bonds. Likewise, we can make some ammonia, methane, you know, by sharing. This delta E is not big enough. And then we can make more complex molecules like this. So this is what we're going to do in the lab tomorrow. In lab tomorrow, we're going to draw structures like this, ionic and molecular. Okay, so we're out of time. Uh, we'll uh, wrap it up here.